Good evening. I'd like to begin tonight by reading to you a little note that the Jessics uh, want to share uh, with you th th uh, this evening. It says, all those who had a helping hands, I thank everyone who helped move the Jessics last Saturday, loading the U-Haul, plus pickup trucks, taking sofas apart, tables apart, whatever was needed, it was done. Uh, chili was served at noon, cake, biscuits also. All did their part, it was a team effort. The results were perfect, no bad accidents recorded. Jesus was present by his spirit and helped us all. Thank you, Lord. I love the Lord and his people. Thank you very much. It was much appreciated. Love, Jim and Jan Yesick. And so they certainly share their thankfulness for the work that went into helping them move. And so I extend that to you. We're gonna continue our study in the book of Colossians tonight but we're going to begin in John chapter 8, so let me invite you to take your Bible and open it to John chapter 8, and we'll begin. Occasionally when I speak, I present the question to those in the audience, what do you believe about Christ? Because what you believe about Christ uh, determines where you're going to spend eternity, and we know that the Jesus asked the Pharisees that in Matthew chapter 22 and verse 42, but Jesus also asked something similar to his disciples, recorded in Matthew 16. Verse 13 through 17 say, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that you're John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but whom do you say that I am? And Simon Peter, speaking for the group, answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood did not real, reveal this to you, but my father, which is in heaven. What an important question to ask and what an important question to have the correct answer to. Why is this question so important? Well, if we look here in John chapter 8, you can follow along as I read verse 21. Here Jesus is speaking. He's interacting again with some Pharisees. And he said to them, I'm going away and you will seek me and you will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. So the Jews said, well, he kill himself because he said, where I go, you cannot come. As they had the false view that if you committed suicide, you couldn't go to heaven. In verse 23, he said to them, you are from beneath, I am from above, you are of this world, I am not of this world. Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Again, what you think of Jesus Christ, what you believe about him, carries with it some very, very important consequences. He said here, you will die in your sin. He repeated it in verse 24 by saying, you will die in your sins. Now, it doesn't say you will die for them because they were paid for, but you will die in them, which means you will die with your sins not being removed. You will die in an unforgiven state, and therefore you'll be condemned for all eternity. And so Jesus presented more than enough evidence to show that he was, in fact, the Messiah. And since he's the Messiah, and if you don't believe in him, you can't go where he is going as he ascended uh, into heaven. He's now seated at the right hand of the Father. And so if you don't believe that Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, you will spend eternity separated from him. We know that the dead, in, dead outside of Christ, those who die not believing in him, are going to be separated from him forever in a place the Bible calls, and Jesus referred to more than anyone, the lake of fire, where souls are going to be tormented day and night forever and ever. And so what do you think about Christ? You know, Jesus is Jehovah. In fact, in Isaiah 45, 22, God said through uh, the prophet Isaiah, turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth, for I am, and that's what I emphasize here, I am God, and there is no other, in fact, there is no other savior, is what it goes on to say. And in the New Testament, we read, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Jesus Christ is the only means by which someone can be saved because he is the Savior. And it's because of what he did as the Savior for mankind that 
makes him the way, the truth, and the life. 1 Peter 2.24 tells us that he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. The issue was sins. The issue Jesus made with the Pharisees here is dying in your sins, but at the cross of Calvary, Jesus bore your sins. See, we deserve to bear God's wrath against sin, but Jesus suffered God's wrath for us in our place. It was the perfect picture of the innocent one dying in the place of the guilty. Jesus was God who became a man, lived a perfect life and never sinned, and he willingly and lovingly went to the cross to bear the wrath that we deserve for our sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says it this way, God made him who had no, had no sin, that's in reference to Christ, to be sin for us or in our place so that in him we might become the righteousness of God, the righteousness that is required for you to go to heaven. It comes only through Christ. And so there is only one way anyone can be saved from God's wrath that is sure to come, as his wrath must be poured out on, against sin, is faith alone in Christ alone. Your willingness to believe on him whom God had sent, or your unwillingness to do that, will determine where you spend eternity. And so Jesus made it clear in verse 24, if you, do, you will die in your sins if you do not believe that I am. So the only thing that separates someone from heaven and hell is their willingness to trust Christ and notice Christ alone as their Savior. He paid for their sins. He removed them. You accept that payment. You have the assurance of everlasting life. Christ gets all the glory. You get all the benefits. Amen to that. But this question, what do you think about the Christ, takes on a slightly different flavor if you've trusted him as your savior. There's a difference, essence to all that when you think of what it means to live the Christian life. If you don't understand the personal work of Christ and what you have in him, when you walk by, as you walk by faith, you're gonna be confused and the life that Christ wants to live in you and through you is not gonna be realized. That's one of the issues going on here in the book of Colossians. In fact, let me invite you now to go to the book of Colossians, chapter 1. Very important. What you think about Christ not only affects first tense salvation, it affects second tense salvation. Very, very important. And we are going to read a passage here where Paul starts to address the issue of who Christ is relative to the Christian life because of the false teaching that was affecting the church at Colossae. And we're going to pick it up in verse 15. He, that's in reference to Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. He's the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by the wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless above reproach in his sight. Paul has been praying for these Colossians, as we know. He wants them to walk in a way that fully pleases him, being fruitful in every good work, being thankful, increasing in the knowledge of God. These are things that are important to God. And one of the reasons he prays these things is because what the Colossians were being tempted to believe would actually thwart that goal because of their false view of who Jesus was. Part of the reason was false teaching confronting these Colossians. And another reason Paul addresses these things that he does in verses 15 and following is because nothing is more vital when it comes to experiencing the power of Christ and fruitfulness than an accurate understanding of who Christ is, who you are in him, and how that he must work in you and through you for those things to be realized. Very, very important. You know, Paul prayed that we would be fruitful in every good work. If you have a misunderstanding of Christ, 
that is going to be thwarted. The fruit bearing that God wants to be, have you be realized in your life is predicated on you having a proper understanding of Christ in terms of his person and power. And if you don't understand that, your efforts are going to be a big swing and a miss. See, Christ is God, and it's God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. That's the essence of the Christian life. And so without truly understanding who Christ really is and what he alone could accomplish through what he does, you're in trouble. That's true again in first tense salvation. If you don't understand the work of the cross and you don't understand his present work in believers, you become a sitting duck for cultic systems and false religious beliefs that will actually take you down a wrong road and inadvertently paralyze you when it comes to bearing fruit for Christ. You know, all false belief systems either reject what the Bible teaches about the person of Christ, in other words, they deny his true humanity, or they deny his deity, or they seek to add something to the work of Christ, whether it be your works or, or some will do, do both. They either subtract from his work or they add to his work, and it muddies the waters, and what it does is it takes the preeminence away from Jesus Christ and verse 18 ended with a very powerful statement by the Apostle Paul that in all things, he's to have the preeminence. And so religion always says <clears throat> that what Christ accomplished on the cross is not sufficient. It's not sufficient for being saved from sin's penalty and it's not sufficient for being saved from sin's power. That's the lie of religion. This is why you need to understand the difference between religion and Christianity. Religion is man's idea, and yet true Christianity is what God says in his word about the person of Christ. Religion puts the emphasis on the work of man, Christianity on the work of God. Religion says, since you're part of the equation, it's a reward. Christianity says, no, salvation is a gift. Religion says works are the key. Christianity says, no, it's unmerited favor, it's all by grace. Religion says, yeah, you need Christ, but that's not enough. Christianity says, it's Christ alone. Religion says you must do perpetually. Christianity says, no, it was done. Christ cried out, it is finished. Religion says achieved. Christianity says, no, it's been accomplished. Religion says try. Christianity says no trust in the work of someone else, namely Christ. Religion can only offer a hope-so salvation, yet true Christianity offers a no-so salvation. You can know you have eternal life. Religion says you need a middleman to help you through Christ. Or Christianity says you need Christ and he is enough. Religion makes your sin the issue. Christianity makes the son the issue. Religion motivates by fear. Christianity is lived by faith. Religion puts you under the law and demands performance. True Christianity is motivated by, motivated by love, the love of Christ in particular. Religion focuses on the externals. Christianity focuses on your heart relationship to the Lord. Religion focuses on religious activity, and yet Christianity is all about being born again and regenerate. Religion emphasizes the horizontal, Christianity, the vertical relationship with God. Religion focuses on your actions. God is concerned first and foremost with your attitude. And again, it's performance versus a loving personal relationship. So important to know these distinctions. And you see these false teachers were emphasizing the religious part of things, and putting these people into bondage. They were apparently represented an early system of Gnosticism, and this would eventually manifest itself in two forms. There's the aesthetic form. Aesthetic form, which means you deny yourself things in order to become spiritual. And this flew out of the philosophy that a lot of the Greeks at that point in time thought that all matter was evil and only pure spirit was good. And so ascetics thought that the only way to overcome the body, which was evil, was through severe treatment of the Bible, some kind of self-abasement. This is why Paul will later say in Colossians 2, they came up with rules, don't touch, don't taste, and so forth. The other end of the spectrum was the licentious group. They taught the opposites. Since the body was evil and only matter, it didn't really matter what you did with it. And so they recommended unbridled licentiousness is the only way to rid the Bible, or excuse me, the body of evil. And you can take your pick, but they're both wrong and they both dishonor the Savior. 
So at the center of this heresy was the integrity of the person and the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. And so just again, give you a background of the book. The Gnostic heresy of Colossae denied the deity and humanity of Jesus Christ. So again, what you think about Christ matters. Secondly, the first one was denying the deity and humanity of Christ. Secondly, it emphasized legalism and intellectualism. Legalism and intellectualism. Well, what does this result in? When you don't give Christ the supremacy that he is entitled to, it results in the denial of the efficacy of Christ's work on the cross. It again communicates that Jesus didn't get it done. And it reduces Christ to one who was merely created, a created being. They're undermining him. Terrible. Now, they'd say he's the most powerful and intelligent being in the universe, but he was still created. He's not like God, but he's, or he was like God, but he was not the same as God. So there are two schools here. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this. Again, I just want to give you a background to the flow of thought or the issues that uh, resulted in Paul addressing these things. There was doceticism. And this got its name from the Greek word dokeo, which meant seem to be like. Those who belong to this school claim that the human Jesus was only a phantom. He had no body. I mean, you think, where are these people? Why do people think like this? But they do. In fact, that's why it's called he only seemed to be, as far as his body was concerned. It meant he only seemed to die on the cross. He was an angelic spirit who appeared in an apparitional form, or with an apparent body, but in reality he was not truly human or God come in the flesh who literally died for man's sin. So that's one end of it. The second school was called Serinthianism. It was named after Serinthus, a late contemporary of John at Ephesus, held that the man Jesus, the son of Joseph and Mary, was preeminent in righteousness and wisdom, and that the Christ came on him at his baptism and empowered his ministry, but left him before his crucifixion, it was only a man who died and rose again. Weird stuff. And yet this is the thing when it's embraced and it's presented in intellectual form, people can fall all over it. But either view eliminated the incarnation and it nullified Christ's redemptive work on the cross. And so this philosophy stemmed from the belief that all matter is evil and only the spirit is good. And so they all would deny that Jesus was the unique God-man who died on the cross for our sins. And this is why part of the reason 1 John was written. The book of 1 John, notice chapter 2, verses 22 and 23. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He's an antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Later in that epistle, by this you know the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. You know, no one struggles with this in our day and age, but this was an issue in the early church, that Christ really wasn't human. Verse 3, and every spirit does not confess that Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist of which you have heard that is coming and is now already in the world. And so these were the issues that were affecting the church. We have different issues today, perhaps. And, and yet, again, they don't give Christ the supremacy that he deserves. And so how does Paul address this? He does this by explaining why Jesus Christ is the supreme one, beginning in verse 15. In fact, verse 15 through 18, it says, He's the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. He's before all things, and in him all things consist. And he's the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead, that in all things me, he may have the preeminence. And so these are the seven things that Paul brings to our attention in these verses. 
He's the image of likeness and the manifestation of the invisible God. Christ is the firstborn or sovereign over the first creation. He's the creator, which means he's the architect, builder, and goal of the universe. He sustains his creation. He's the sovereign head of the new spiritual creation, the church. He's the firstborn from the dead, and so he is the preeminent one of all things. And this, he expands on that in verses 19 and 20 by just explaining that Jesus Christ is the reconciler, that he's the one who's made peace, and again, it was his work, it was through the blood of the cross. And so in verses 17, excuse me, verses 15 through 18, Paul presents the supremacy of Christ in his person related to God. Verses 16 and 17, or the second half of 15, 16 and 17, in his relation to creation, and verse 18, in his relation to the church. So let's look at this here. In relation to God, and this is from verse 15, Christ is the image of the invisible God. Very straightforward statement. See, Gnosticism taught that God was a spirit and good and that matter and the world were hopelessly evil. And since God is good, he couldn't have created matter because matter is evil. And so some lesser deity showed up and made a mistake and created evil matter. This is how they would view this thing. It's not what the Bible says, and that's why Paul addresses these things right here. And so in relation to God, Christ is the image of the invisible God, which means he's the exact likeness and manifestation of God. And so on your handout, the word image there is the Greek word icon, a term that expresses the concept of re representation and manifestation. Jesus Christ makes the unseen God visible. In fact, the Greek word icon there was used in describing the image of Caesar on a coin, used in Matthew chapter 22. And he, Jesus, said to them, whose likeness and description is this? They said unto him, Caesar's. And so this word here, likeness, was the word icon. Then he said to them, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God. See, we get our English word icon from this, which has a range of meanings, from literally statue to figurative uses such as representation or likeness or manifestation. Again, the exact meaning is always determined by the context. But even as you think of this here, the average person living in this country could never have a chance to see Caesar but they could know what Caesar looked like when they had a coin with his image on it. Now the word itself does not imply perfect image. The context, however, here demands that meaning here. And that's why the word invisible is so important. He's the image of the invisible God. We know from John 4, 24 that God is a spirit and a spirit has not flesh and bones. He's invisible to the human eye. And so God is not just invisible to the human eye because he's a spirit. He's also incomprehensible to human minds because his thoughts are far above our thoughts. We can't really know God by our own wisdom. In fact, we know from the book of 1 Corinthians, the foolishness of God is stronger than any wisdom man could have. So God says, I reveal myself through Christ. That's what he did. And so by the use of the word image here, icon, Paul is stressing that Jesus Christ is the perfect manifestation of a God we cannot see because he's invisible. This is why Jesus said at various occasions, if you've seen him, you've seen the Father. This is what he said to his disciples on the eve of his crucifixion. Now that you have known me, he said to them, you will know my Father also. And from now on, you do know him and you have seen him. And Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father. It's all we need. Jesus answered, for a long time I've been with you all, yet you do not know me, Philip. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Why then do you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe, Philip, that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Jesus Christ came to do that very thing. Very, very important. 
See, the very nature and character of God has been perfectly revealed in Christ. It's through him that which is invisible has become visible. Both the Old and New Testaments make it plain that no one has ever seen God, and yet Jesus Christ came to reveal him. That's what we read in John 1.18. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, but who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. That's in Jesus Christ. The only begotten Son has made God the Father known. Even in Philippians 2.6, we're told that Jesus Christ did not, who was deity, he was equal with God, did not consider it something to hang on to. He willingly set aside the use of his divine attributes, but that whole statement implies that Jesus is God. He didn't have to hang on to it because he was God. Notice what Hebrews 1.3 says regarding the Son. The Son is the radiance of God's glory, and notice the exact representation of his being. Jesus is the exact representation of God's being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he'd provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. And so Jesus demonstrates the character and nature of God, similar in which light radiating from the sun reveals the nature of the sun. And so that description of God as invisible is emphatic because of that very thing. Jesus is not a copy of God, like a statue or a graven image. He's both the physical expression of the invisible God and the visible form or the manifestation of God. It's only through Jesus we can grasp who God really is. That's what we're being told here. And so Paul is using that word to show that Christ is both the representation of who God is and the manifestation of who God is, clearly claiming his deity. In fact, the word is here is kind of important. Notice verse 15, it says, he is the image of the invisible God. What does that indicate? Paul uses the present tense of Greek word amy, which stresses that Christ is, present tense, always and everywhere the manifestation of God. Present tense. There's never been a time where Christ hasn't been that. It's impossible. And so the very nature of God has been perfectly revealed in him. Through Christ, we can say the invisible God has become visible. He's the unique likeness and manifestation of God. And that makes sense because only God can reveal God. I mean, how else can it be? You know, it's interesting, you and I were made in the image of God, but that's different. We we're made in the image in the sense that we've got moral qualities, we have a mind, we have emotions, we have a volition. We can think and feel and make decisions. We're morally responsible before God. But that image, after the fall, has been terribly marred by sin. But even then, we still reflect to some degree the image of God. But Jesus Christ is the perfect manifestation of God. Big difference. In fact, the hope and goal of every believer in time is being made in the image of God by being changed into the image of Christ in this same sense. And it's not a physical image, it's a character image. As you and I grow in the grace and knowledge of the Savior, as we have a love affair with Christ and we allow him to transform us, we become more like Christ in our character. That's the goal. This is what we're told in in even 2 Corinthians 4 and 2 Corinthians 3.18. The God of the sage has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And then that same, or right prior to that, Paul said, and we all, this is believers, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, and you do that through the word of God, are being transformed into his image, with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord transforms you from the inside out into the image of Christ as you behold Christ by faith in the Word of God. And so the declaration of Jesus 
Being the image of God is Paul's first step into establishing Jesus' deity and completely crushing these heresies that were undermining the believers at Colossae. He's not some lesser being, he's God. End of story. And that's very important to understand. That understanding our relationship to God the Father through Jesus is very, very critical. That's why Christ said, without me, you can do nothing, because it's Christ as God through the Spirit working in you and through you to transform you, not some lesser being. But the next step Paul takes in establishing Christ's deity and declaring his relationship to God is by mentioning creation. So relative to creation, Christ is what? It says here he's the firstborn over all creation. Verse 15, not only is he the image of the invisible God, he is the firstborn over all creation. What does this mean? What does it mean to be the firstborn over all creation? It means Christ is prior to and sovereign over the whole creation. He's prior to and sovereign over the whole creation. Now these words here have been a source of great debate with certain cultic groups because at first glance they make it seem like Jesus Christ was created. He was part of creation and that's what a Jehovah Witness would tell you. They would say he was the first created being and then he created everything else. No, 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 no. And that's totally wrong for a number of reasons. First. First, the context. Verse 16 blows it out of the way. For by him all things were created. Well, that kind of blows that out of the water, doesn't it? Things that are in heaven, things that are on earth, visible, invisible, etc. It's also inconsistent with the new, rest of the New Testament. What does John 1.3 say? All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. He didn't create himself. He existed and then created it. And someone else didn't create him, so he could create. He's always existed here. And then the third reason I can give you is the understanding of the, the word firstborn and what that word really means. It's the Greek word prototokosis, or protoko, easy for me to say. It has two connotations. Protos may mean first in time or first in rank. And we can, in English it means either priority or sovereignty. See, the term really means first, foremost in importance. It's about being first in rank, first in power. In fact, this is how the word is used in a Messianic Psalm 89, verse 27. Also, I will make him my firstborn higher than the kings of the earth. This is speaking about God making Jesus Christ the sovereign one, higher than all the kings of the earth. That's where that word is used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And so Paul here is effectively countering any claim of the heretics at Colossae that Christ was some angelic emanation from God and part of his creation. He's saying no. He's creation's Lord. That's what he's trying to say here. Just to give you an idea of how the term was used even in the Old Testament, Jesus giving, or excuse me, God giving instruction to Moses what he's going to say to Pharaoh. And he says, You shall say to Pharaoh, Thus said the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. Well, what does that mean? I mean, Adam was the first one made, first man. And even with God's covenant with Abraham, I mean, Here, Israel was the grandson of Abraham, but yet he made Israel his firstborn in the sense that God had given him superiority to the descendants of Israel as a nation that he called to bear his name. I'm going to raise you to the foremost position. I'm going to throw in some stuff by Norman Geisler. 
who is with the Lord now, but he was an apologist, and he wrote some things here about this passage that I thought would be helpful for me to just mention. He says, though it's grammatically possible to translate this as firstborn in creation, the context makes this impossible for five reasons. The whole point of the passage in the book is to show Christ's superiority over all things, and that's certainly coming out in this passage. Other statements about Christ in this passage, such as creator of all, an upholder of creation, verse 17, clearly indicate his priority and superiority over creation. Three, the term firstborn cannot be part of creation if he created all things. One cannot create himself. Jehovah Witnesses wrongly add the word other six times in this passage in the New World Translation. Thus, they suggest that Christ created all other things after he was created, but the word other is not in the Greek, and that's why it's a horrible translation. They change the words to fit their, their false theology. Number four, the firstborn received worship of all the angels in Hebrews 1.6. But creatures should not be worshipped. God made that clear. You are to worship God and God alone, and since the firstborn received it, he must be God. Five, the Greek word for firstborn is protokotos. If Christ were the first created, then the Greek word would have been protoktisis. And so those are important things that just, again, reinforce the reality that Jesus Christ is God, and that's what Paul is trying to do here. In fact, if Jesus was the firstborn of a class of others also born, then how would he be called the only begotten son? He wouldn't be. It has to be one or the other. He cannot be the first of a group and then be the only person in that group. In fact, I want to give you the New World Translation here, just to show you where they added to it. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over creation, because it means of him, this word's not in the Greek. All other things are created in the heavens and on the earth, things visible, the things invisible, whether thrones or lordships or governments or authorities, all other things, wrong, have been created through him and for him. Also, he's before all other things, wrong, and by means of him, all other things, See, they added those things to fit their theology. Those words are not part of the manuscript. And so what does the term firstborn denote? When it comes to creation, it can't be order of birth. And so it's denoting two things. One, he preceded the whole creation. In other words, he existed prior to it. And then he's sovereign over it. You know, in the Old Testament, a firstborn child not only had priority of birth, but also had superiority when it came to those, the things that came with that birth. You know, when Jesus Christ himself, for example, declared himself to be the first in Revelation 1.17. He says, don't be afraid, I am the first. That means I'm absolutely first. I'm the first and the last. I'm the living one. I was dead and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And so the whole term firstborn speaks of Christ's priority to all creation in time and his sovereignty over all creation in rank. He is the preeminent one. He created all things, so he's prior to it. And he's over all things. He's the sovereign God of the universe. And Paul explains this in verses 16 and 17. He makes the statement, he's the firstborn of all creation, he's the highest in rank and sovereign over it all. How do we know, verse 16? For by him all things were created that are in heaven, in earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. He's before all things, and in him all things consist. And so, in relation to creation, Christ is the creator of the universe, he's saying. The word for there is the explanatory or causal for, we could insert the word because. 
He's giving us the reason why Christ is the image of God, because he's the creator of the universe. And he's sovereign over these things relative to creation because of the three prepositional phrases used to describe this relationship. In verse 16, he says, all things were created. It says here, reverse, uh, yeah. Through him and for him. Verse 16, it says, by him. There's a thing there, it should be translated in him. For in him, all things are created. How does verse 16 end? All things are created through him and for him. And these explain this very well. See, in him tells us that the sun is the place where the eternal plans and ideas of creation have their source. He is the sphere in which all creation was come up with. All the plans and forces of creation were residing in him so that God's creation takes place in Christ and not separate from him. He's the architect of it all. And frankly, that should blow your brain. I mean, you look at all the, this time of year, everyone gets flowers and plants it. And they're all so beautiful and pretty and unique. And God, Jesus Christ thought up all that ahead of time. He's in charge of all the variety you see in the trees and the flowers and the plants and the bugs and the insects, even your own human body. You know, he decided in eternity past how you were going to be formed. He made you the unique creation you are. David brings this out. He says, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. God made you very unique, very special. He decided everything about you. And he loves you supremely. Amazing. You know, even in the natural world, when someone erects a substantial building, you have an architect who designs it, you have a builder who does it, and you have an owner, and Christ is all three. He designed all things. All things are in him. He built all things. All things came through him. He's the agent of creation. And all things are for him, which means he's the goal of it all. (coughs) And this is exactly what we're going to say after the rapture in heaven. Revelation 4.11. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you has created all things, and for your pleasure they are and were created you realize you were created for the pleasure of God? You know, it's easy to think that, and there's people that get stuck in this trap, that God simply exists for them. And you know, God does exist for you. But if you're going to have a life that honors the Lord and even has peace in your own soul, you have to think in terms of you exist for God. It's your privilege to worship and honor Him, especially based on what He's done for you through Christ. That's what it's all about. He's the goal of creation. He created and designed you and everything else to glorify himself. You know, and this is why we're, we read that the heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament shows handiwork. All these things are, are speaking out praise to God. And should you be any different? Absolutely not. Well, how much did Christ create? Well, we see here in verse 16, by him half the things were created. Oh, wait. It says all things were created. All things. All things is created. It's mentioned twice in these verses for emphasis. It's mentioned at the beginning of verse 16. For by him, by him all things are created. How does the verse end? All things were created through him and for him. It's mentioned twice for emphasis. All things where? Heaven and earth. That pretty much covers it all. What kinds of things? The stuff you can see and the stuff you can't see, whether it's visible or invisible. Now, why does Paul mention visible and invisible? It's because of the false belief of dualism. 
Again, they thought that material things were innately evil and immaterial things were innately good. That's not true. And you know, I can see where through at times, through different bents that believers have, that they can take this to a degree where they shouldn't. You know, some people think that meat is evil. You can't show me that in the Bible. Tomatoes are good. You know, there's nothing inherently wrong with anything. God created a tobacco plant and called it very good. Now, what man does with that can make it evil. Alcohol in and of itself is not evil, but what man can do with that can make it evil. But nothing is unclean in itself. What this verse also does is it puts to rest those who want to mix evolution with creation. Some call themselves theistic evolutionists who say that God got the ball rolling and then evolution took over. Bunk. And that's why you should never use the term Mother Nature, because she doesn't exist. And I'm not saying you shouldn't respect God's creation, because you should. But don't follow this bumper sticker that I see once in a while that says, love your mother, and it's a picture of the earth. The earth is not your mother, and God is your father. But why does he mention thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers? Well, these things are in reference to the angelic beings, both good and evil. And the Gnostic heretics thought the creation centered in a series of angelic beings. And so Paul mentioned these things because he's debunking that false theology. Angels did not create things. Jesus Christ is the creator. He thought it up, he made it, and he's the goal of it. End of story. And so, again, these Gnostics wanted to exalt angels. Paul addresses that in chapter 2, in verse 18, when he talks about this silly worshiping of angels that was going on in, in the church. Well, he continues in verse 17 by saying these things. Relation to creation, Christ is the pre-existence and the priority of things, and he's the sustainer of things. It says here that Jesus Christ, who is the image of God, is before all things, and in him all things consist. All things consist. So he's the sustainer of things, He's the pre-existence and the priority of things. Again, he's the architect, builder, and goal. And when it says he is, that's the emphatic use of the Greek word autos. It means he himself and no one else. There's no one else you can throw in the mix there. It belongs to Christ and Christ alone. And it says he existed before anything was. That's one of the things he's communicating here. He existed before anything was. This is why in John chapter 8, when the Pharisees were disrespecting him, then the Jews said to him, you're not yet 50 years old and you've seen Abraham? And Jesus said to them in a stunning declaration of deity, most assuredly I say to you before Abraham was, I am. Boom! I am before anything was created. Of course, you know, the next verse says the Jews picked up stones to stone him because from their mind, they didn't believe that Jesus was God. And so that was a, to make a claim like that was blasphemy and worthy of stoning under Mosaic law. But again, Jesus is not some lesser created being who later created the universe or matter. He says, I am, I existed. See the word before here, is the preposition in the Greek pro, which may refer to time or priority or status, but it means before. Jesus Christ is before all things. He existed before these things. And the word can mean priority, so not only did he exist before these things, but he's the priority of all these things. It's all about Jesus. And then we have the word in verse 17, by him all things consist. 
What does consist mean? It's the Greek word sunestimi, and it means to bring together, unite, or collect, and then continue, endure, exist, or hold together. Jesus brings it all together, and then Jesus is holding the whole thing together. Are you impressed with Jesus? Are you impressed with your Savior? Do you recognize who he is? It's amazing. He's holding it all together. So not only did Jesus create everything, he continues to hold it all together. In fact, the verb tense here is in the perfect, which means Jesus brought it together in the past, he's holding it together in the past, and he continues to hold it together right now in the present. He didn't create everything and then walk away from it, like these deists believe, and undoubtedly the Gnostics somehow taught. He continues his involvement to the very present and the fact that without his continued intervention, creation would not continue to stand. It wouldn't hold together. It would unravel. I mean, I don't know if you're like me, but I look around and I wonder many, many times, why hasn't the whole thing caved in yet? It's not through the efforts of man. Don't think it's mankind doing and intervening here in these unbelievable waves so that the world hasn't crumbled yet. The only one holding this thing together is Jesus Christ. He's the sustainer of his creation. He's the nuclear glue that holds it all together. So Christ not only think it, thought it up, he then designed it. Then, as the agent of creation, he made it, which means he's the goal of it. And in between the time he created it until now, until the end of it, he's holding it all together. Are you impressed? You know, it's interesting, you would think, this is where science comes in. All the scientific laws by which this world functions in order and not chaos are an expression of the mind of Jesus Christ. You know who invented the law of gravity? Jesus Christ. The rest of the laws which the universe hangs together. They're scientific laws, yes, but they're divinely instituted scientific laws. You know, we live in a world that's driven by science. And the goal of so many, especially in our day and age, is to try to explain everything away by leaving out God, and so they say, I, I mean, I've talked to people, I only believe in science, and yet none of it delivers the goods. It all falls short. I mean, science is progressing. They understand the atom now to the degrees they, you know, they didn't even just a few years ago, yet they still don't know what holds it all together. There's all kinds of subatomic particles beyond protons, neutrons, and electrons. And they're even classified in, in different ways by the forces that, that they think hold or control them. And so scientists will postulate all these different things about why these atoms hold together, and yet they don't understand them. But we do know that when whatever holds atoms together lets go, there's a huge release of energy that can lead to a chain reaction of what we call nuclear explosion. Amazing. Who's holding it all together? God. Jesus Christ, the one who made it. You know who's holding you together? Jesus Christ. You can take all the vitamins in the world and every other thing you can think of, and when Jesus Christ says, you, it's your time, it's your time. In fact, it says in Acts, we live and move and have our being only because of Christ. And so how should this impress you? Let's, let's, let's kind of close today in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Excuse me, 2 Peter chapter 3, my fault. 2 Peter chapter 3. Notice verse 7. 
But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is, with, is as a thousand years, and a thousand years this is one day. And the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants all to change their mind and believe on Christ. Verse 10, But the day of the Lord, the coming day of judgment, will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. You know, there's going to be a day coming that Jesus Christ is going to say, I've been holding this together long enough. I'm going to let her go. Verse 11, therefore, how should this impact you and how should this impact me? Since all these things are going to be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? You know, it's our privilege because of who Christ is, what he's done for us, how he's holding us all together to redeem the time for him. And we're to do so looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be dissolved being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. All these things will be dissolved. How should this impact you? How should you then live? You should live with an eye to the fact that Christ can come back today, that I can make the moment count today, that he's given me life and breath and purpose today. He's sustaining me today. My tomorrow is not guaranteed on earth. It's guaranteed forever in heaven, and I'm so grateful for that. But are you giving Jesus Christ the preeminence that he is entitled to? Do you recognize that without him, you are nothing and can do nothing? So good to be reminded to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God that he might exalt us in due times and honor him with our hearts and lips. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity to just be impressed with Jesus Christ once again. Thank you that he is the one who thought about creation. He's the one that formed it and designed it. He's the one that actually created it. He's the one who is sustaining it. And not only is that the physical world, but that's us as well. Thank you especially for his redemptive work, that he went to the cross and there took upon himself all of our sin and rebellion and disrespect, paid for it in full, rose again, and freely gives life to any and all. And that life which we have in Christ is actually his life living in us. May we just humble ourselves and be willing to honor him with all that you've given us in love. And we pray these things and give thanks in Jesus' name.